Have you ever wondered how the continents have been shifting throughout Earth's history? Well, in this video, we're going to be talking about Cretaceous paleogeography, aka where the continents were during the Cretaceous period and how that affected the climate and the overall environment of the Cretaceous period. So just for reference, this is a timeline of Earth's history going from oldest to youngest, from right to left. And we can see over here on the left, I've circled the Mesozoic because that is the era in which the Cretaceous period occurred. The Cretaceous period is the last period of the Mesozoic. The two periods before the Cretaceous are the Triassic and Jurassic, and those three periods make up the Mesozoic era. And that is what we'll be focusing on in this video. Before the Mesozoic era was the Paleozoic, and afterwards was the Cenozoic, in which we are currently. Is that how I say that? Which we were, are currently in. We're in the Cenozoic. Okay, next. So before we get to the Cretaceous, geography specifically, let's talk a little bit about the periods just before the Cretaceous and the earlier Mesozoic, such as the Triassic period, the first period of the Mesozoic that went from around 250 to around 200 million years ago. The continents during this period were in two major clumps of continents. Well, they're clumps of continents to us because they hadn't split up yet into the present day formation, but back then they were just called supercontinents. And these two supercontinents were Gondwana land in the south and Laurasia north of that. And then there was the Tethys Sea and the Absaroka shallow epicontinental sea in the North America region. And we'll see this sea, we'll see this sea <laughs> and other seas like it develop throughout the Mesozoic era. Then if we move into the Jurassic period, which was around 200 to 145 million years ago, just before the Cretaceous period, Laurasia had broken up almost completely in the Jurassic and Gondwana land remained intact, but did change in shape and kind of primed itself for the shapes that it was about to break up into in the Cretaceous period. As we see in the Cretaceous, Laurasia continued to split, Greenland split from North America, and Gondwana land split into South America, Africa, and Peninsular India. And the only one staying in contact with each other was Antarctica and Australia, which at that point there had not been any Antarctica and Australia. We're just talking in terms of modern day continental configuration. And those were still one mass, as we can see in this image here. And they did not split up until after the Cretaceous. But most of the other modern continents did split up into their almost similar to today configuration during this time. Obviously, Australia split up after the Cretaceous from Antarctica and moved up, and then India moved way upward. That's when obviously you get the continent continent conversion that formed the Himalayas and so on. But during the Cretaceous, this is as far as things had gotten. And as these continents were shifting, obviously oceans were also changing in size and shifting around as well. For example, the opening of the South Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean Sea occurred in the early Cretaceous. And it wasn't just oceans that were forming, widening, narrowing, and changing during the Cretaceous. There was also plenty of seas, like I mentioned earlier. Like we can see in these two images, both occurring in, well, the early Cretaceous and then the bottom one later on in the Cretaceous, there were two major shallow seas overlying much of North America during this time. And I'll get to those seas and their significance later. But before we talk about these seas, we have to talk about the reason they're there. The first reason was global sea level rose. The second reason is tectonics, which I'll get to in a later slide. But the global sea level rose and oxygen isotopes and plant fossils indicate that the sea surface temperature was around seven degrees warmer than it was today. And near the poles, it was even more than that. It was around 10 degrees Celsius warmer at the poles than it is today. And for reference, this is a lot of degrees. This is not like minor. It's quite a big change for global average. In fact, things were so warm at the poles that in Alaska, Greenland, and Antarctica, warm adapted plants were growing based on fossil evidence, and this was a greenhouse climate. This was a very warm period in the Cretaceous, and that had an enormous effect on 
on ocean circulation. Today, cold water at the poles sinks and drives deep ocean circulation and also provides oxygen to deep water, mixing the ocean so that it remains well oxygenated. In the Cretaceous, however, polar water was too warm to sink, leading to stagnant water columns throughout the ocean. This caused anoxic bottom waters. There wasn't any mixing or providing of oxygen to those deep waters, and it wasn't just water not sinking that was the problem. Another method of ocean mixing is upwelling at oceanic margins caused by surface winds, and this upwelling provides nutrients to surface waters. But at this time during the Cretaceous, the temperature gradient from the equator to the poles was not strong enough, like it is today, to allow upwelling. If anything, it, there was maybe weak upwelling because the temperature gradient from equator to poles was weak, causing weak winds. You need a strong temperature gradient to make strong winds to make strong upwelling. So this just exacerbated that stagnant ocean problem, causing more anoxic ocean conditions. These types of events where the ocean becomes extremely anoxic or basically without oxygen, sorry if I didn't define that, these kinds of events are called ocean anoxic events or OAEs. And there were two major OAEs during the mid Cretaceous. And you can see my biogeochemistry part two video for more on how anoxic events are terminated and regular conditions come back around. It's all cyclic. And so certain things cause other things that bring it back to normal. These are called feedback mechanisms. I talk about that in that video in way more depth. But the bigger importance here that I want to point out about OAEs is that they are extremely important warnings for our current warming trend, our current situation in terms of climate change. Understanding when they occurred, why they occurred, how they occurred, and how long they occurred for in Earth's history is extremely important for understanding our future, our oceanic conditions, because the ocean, even though we don't live in it, really does control a lot of Earth's processes, and we don't want it to go into a cycle where it goes off the deep end in terms of ocean anoxia, or else a lot of things are going to die. And those are things that we and many other species rely on. And then, you know, those species that rely on them will die. And it's a chain effect. And many species will die. This is extinction events. This is how it happens. It's not fun. Let's not do it. Let's study OAEs in Earth's history so we know more about them. And we know what causes and exacerbates them so we can avoid those things. Okay, moving on now. Let's get back to the Cretaceous and what finally helped its oceans become oxygenated once again. Basically, between the mid to late Cretaceous, there was a major change in ocean circulation highlighted by oxygen isotopes in the rock record. And this change was due to surface waters at high latitudes that cooled, allowing them to sink and carry oxygen to the bottom waters once again. This change in ocean circulation plus a decrease in carbon dioxide is thought to have led to polar cooling, allowing the poles to cool to the point that the equator to pole temperature gradient becomes stronger and therefore again upwelling becomes stronger and ocean mixing becomes stronger even more so. So bringing it back to those well oxygenated, well circulated oceans was occurring during the transition from mid to late Cretaceous. Moving on to Cretaceous tectonics before we can get to those seas that I mentioned that were on the North American continent because the tectonics are what formed the basin that that sea could fill. So let's talk a little bit about the three stages that formed the Cordillera and mobile belt that we know today at the western margin of North America. This mobile belt has undergone three major mountain building events or orogenies. The first was the Nevada orogeny occurring in the late Jurassic period, and the second was the severe orogeny occurring in the Cretaceous. So we'll talk more about the severe because that's the Cretaceous, what we're talking about today. During the Cretaceous, the severe orogeny marked shallower subduction of the plate under North America, and this shallower subduction led to an inland migration of all the things caused by subduction, igneous activity, mountain building, folding and thrusting, and this shallower subduction of the plate. So you can see the angle of subduction of the plate here is steeper than in the severe orogeny down here. It's flatter. That was because of a faster movement of the North American plate toward the subducting plate, causing faster rollback, or basically as it moves, it kind of 
rolls back the subducting plate. I don't know if that, I, that makes sense, but it was because of the faster movement of the North American plate and the shallower the subduction, the further inland the plate must subduct before it gets deep enough into the mantle to cause melting, to cause igneous activity. So that was the reason for the further inland push of you know everything that comes along with subduction, igneous activity, mountain building, folding, thrusting, and all of that. So east of this severe orogeny was the vast Foreland Basin which, due to high sea level, was filled with many shallow seas throughout the Mesozoic. And during the Cretaceous specifically, the Maori Sea in the upper picture is shown, and that was almost connecting fully the Arctic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, but not quite. But then we get further in the Cretaceous, and it was fully connected at that point, and that is called the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. This Cretaceous Interior Seaway preserved all that encompasses the Cretaceous period in all of its glory. Ammonites, rudists, other dominant mollusks, dinosaurs, of course, coccolithophores, which created vast deposits of chalk during the Cretaceous. That's why it's called Cretaceous, actually. Creta means chalk. Planktonic forams and other benthic forams that gave us oxygen isotopes to interpret the temperature of the Cretaceous seas. Angiosperms or flowering plants, which evolved and diversified greatly in the Cretaceous. Even the black shales that told us about the ocean anoxic events that occurred during the mid-Cretaceous. Nearly everything that encompasses the Cretaceous is preserved in deposits from the Cretaceous Interior Seaway and other shallow seas throughout the continental masses of the world that correlate worldwide. And because we are talking about the Cretaceous period, I must also talk a little bit about the Grand Canyon, which was largely excavated to its current depth during the Cretaceous. But but this was actually done by a river that flowed in the opposite direction of today's Colorado River. Why was there a flow direction change since then? Why didn't it keep flowing in the same direction? Why did it change? Well, that brings us to our third and final. You may have remembered that I mentioned three stages of mountain building events for the Cordilleran orogeny. Well, I mentioned the first two, the Nevadan and the Jurassic, the Severe and the Cretaceous, and then there was a third called the Laramide orogeny, which started in the very, very, very latest Cretaceous and went into the Cenozoic until the Eocene epoch. The Laramide caused permanent reversal of flow direction through this canyon during that beginning part of the Laramide at the latest Cretaceous. So the river that flowed in the opposite direction before the Laramide orogeny began carved out much of the canyon and then the Laramide began and reversed the direction. And since this flow direction reversal at the beginning of the Laramide, the flow direction has now stayed the same. If you want to know more about the Cretaceous period and all of its glory, like the Cretaceous life, you can watch my Cretaceous world video. And if you want to know more about the end Cretaceous extinction event, you can watch that video, which may or may not be out by the time you're watching this. But those two videos I'm also going to do about the Cretaceous because the Cretaceous was an incredible time that deserves three videos. And and those are the other two in this series of Cretaceous videos. The reference I'm using to make these videos is Earth System History. It's linked in my description below as well as other minor and supporting references like always. And if you want to check out the entire History of Earth video playlist that I've done, you can check out my historical geology playlist. It'll be, you know, pop up here at some point in the video if it hasn't already. And you can click on that and watch the rest of the historical geology playlist. And with that, guys, I thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys next time. Bye.